Now, as we look at the false mirror, at first it can be a little bit unsettling. Like a lot of surrealist work, it has this mashup of things that don't seem to fit together. It's this dreamlike quality. We're looking at a recognizable eye, but then the the iris is replaced with a blue sky and clouds. The pupil or the black circle in the center seems to sort of hang, almost detached, floating in this sky that is contained within the eye. The false mirror was first painted in 1928. It was a time when people were sort of recovering from the horrors of World War I, and artists were getting a little bit more philosophical. They were reading they were reading the works of people like Sigmund Freud and his theory of the unconscious mind. And what artists, particularly in the surrealist movement, were trying to do through things like automatic drawing or the exquisite corpse technique of sort of blind collaboration and free associations, they were trying to get at the unconscious mind. They were trying to make art that was not filtered by sort of societal expectations about what is proper and what is improper. The False Mirror was almost an instant hit in the art world. I mean, this is one of those rare instances in the 20th century where within a decade of it being painted, it was in the museum and it was housed in in MoMA in their permanent collection. This was painted in 1928. It spent some time with Man Ray in his collection, and then in 1936, it was purchased by the Museum of Modern Art New York, and it's been there ever since. And like a lot of artists, you know, Magritte, he played the hits. He knew what people liked. And so in 1935, he made another version, Oil on Canvas, and that went, that was sold to a private collector. It's been in a private collection ever since. And then again, 1952... He re- revisits the classics. He, he made a third version, gouache on paper. Uh, but like I said, this was a hit, and it is said to be one of the inspirations for um, CBS Television's I logo that was designed by William Golden in 1952. I think part of the success is Magritte was really tapping into the spirit of the time. He was exploring these ideas of psychology and philosophy that were very influential on a lot of his contemporaries, but he did it in a way that seemed a little bit lighter and more playful than a lot of what other artists were doing. A lot of that sort of post-war period was focusing on sort of the horrors of war in addition to all other things. It was a way people were processing what they had just seen. And, you know, Magritte he wasn't getting so dark with it. And I think that made it more palatable to a lot of people. You know, as we're looking at this painting of a giant eye, it is a wide eye. It seems like, you know, it could be seen as confronting us because the eye is looking out at us, or it could be seen as just this sort of funny notion of viewers are looking at a painting that's looking back out at them. There is a little bit of a mirror, but it's not a true reflection. And I think the the titles that Magritte would give his paintings were also demonstrating that playful nature. You know, it's a false mirror. It is a painting looking out at us, looking out at the painting, but it's not a true reflection. There's not true symmetry there. And of course, while we're looking out at this painting and it's looking out at us, what we actually see reflected on the eye is not a person looking at it. It's not a shadowy, vague figure. It's just blue sky and white, fluffy clouds. The pupil takes on this new dimension as it is this matte black circle that is almost suspended, floating in that sky. There's this disconnect between the reflection or, you know, the image we see in the iris and the rest of the eye. I think it's also worth noting that Magritte was a painter who used the titles of his work to aid the viewer in understanding the piece. By calling this painting the false mirror, we get questions of objectivity and perception. The mirror simply reflects what's placed before it, but the eye... It's a selective focus. The human eye takes in light, then sends signals to the brain to interpret what's being seen. 
it's not acting as a mirror, but more of a sort of filter for the light and images around us. And so in that sense, there is a little bit of a falseness to what our eyes are perceiving, to what's being reflected. And so on many levels, this is a false mirror. This is not a true reflection of what that eye is seeing or what we are perceiving. The eye is a little bit faulty. It does have some sort of bias. It does have a selective focus, and it reflects only sort of what the viewer wants to see. And I think the reason that Magritte is so popular, and this piece in particular, is because he's able to raise all these questions and hint at all of these big ideas with just a simple painting of a close-cropped eye. We can't even see the full face or the expression, and yet we have a sense of an expression as that eye seems to be so wide. He alludes to all of these different things creating that sort of unreal sense, that dreamlike quality of the iris replaced by the blue sky and that false reflection that could not be on a real eye, and yet somehow it seems to fit almost perfectly within that image. It's this seamless connection between things that really are not related or connected that draws us in, that asks the viewer to make connections and puzzle over this. It's his choice to leave it all a little bit unresolved, a little bit unsettled, and yet feels so polished and settled. That's what makes this piece so great. For this project, we're going to be making our own sort of version of Magritte's uh, famous painting. And I'm going to start off with just the eye. I'm drawing in Sharpie, which obviously is a terrible idea for any of you to be doing. Um, do as I say, not as I do. I, I'm only using the Sharpie because it shows up better on camera. You should be starting off sketching in pencil. Um, one thing that I always try to recommend doing as I'm drawing the eye, um, you'll notice it's not like a perfect sort of oval or football shape. It's a little bit pinched at the corners, and I leave a little bit where like the, that sort of tear duct is. And then when I'm drawing the iris and the pupil, I, I start off with a circle that is like so large, it's covered up a little bit at the top and bottom by the eyelid. Um, when I when I draw the pupil, I'm drawing a smaller circle inside of there, obviously, and I leave a little bit of a highlight where the light's reflecting off it. I made it kind of cartoonish. That's just sort of the style that I think I, I've always been drawn to, and I think it works for um, these illustrations in the video. Um, now, inside the eye, you can put whatever you want. Part of the idea with surrealism is free associations and sort of creating subconscious connections between things. So I replaced like Magritte's cloud imagery with um, another famous work, Van Gogh's Starry Night. Um, just a, my own quick sort of simple version of that. And... I am coloring with crayons. Of course, during remote learning, you have your choice of materials. You could do this very easily with paints, with other materials. One of the things I really like about crayons is it allows me, it allows me to make my work more colorful. So, uh, with the Van Gogh piece, you know, impressionists and post-impressionists were so much focused on color, the expressive qualities to it. Also, the way that our eyes perceived color. So there's a little bit of the optical color theory happening there where these streaks and dots and dashes of colors are unblended um, by the paintbrush. They are blended by the viewer's eye, which obviously, you know, like I said, free associations kind of between the eye, the iris, the the image inside of the eye and optical color theory, it, all that's not lost on me. But I, I always like to try to have these different layers of meaning to my work as I'm creating it. So like I make these associations that enrich the piece. Um, at least to me, they enrich it when I can start to make different connections to a piece. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the shading on the eye. One of the most common mistakes people make is they leave the, the white of the eye as pure white, but even though the eyelids are very thin, they do actually cast a shadow. And the eyeball, it is a ball. It is a sphere. So you're going to have a little bit of shadow um, and, and shading where it's going to look a little bit darker sort of towards the edges around the perimeter. Um, I, I put darker shadows sort of over the eyelid where the, the crease is, where it sort of goes back into, um, into the, the eye sockets. Um, 
I put a little bit of a shadow along sort of defining the edge where the, like the nose would be and things like that. Uh, one of the most common mistakes that students make as they are, are shading is they don't make the shadows dark enough. You want to have a wide range of values. Um, you know, students often ask me, like, like, where's the skin colored crayons or markers? Like, there is no skin color. It's not one singular color. Um, even on one person, there's going to be a range of values and a range of hues even on their skin. So, you know, you might make it a darker or lighter skin in some areas, but, but even on the same person, there's going to be that range of values. And you want to have very dark shadows, very sort of light highlights. I mix in a little bit of and sort of pink in some areas to make it a little bit warmer brown for the skin tone um, because generally speaking a person's skin is going to be usually a warmer br brown or beige tone so I, I mix in a little bit of pinks in some areas maybe a little bit of yellow in some areas I might use a darker brown in some areas to make the the shadows a little bit darker I want to have the highlight shadows and mid-tones and like I said, you want a wide range of values to make it visible, even from a distance. Um, the most common mistake students go is they go too subtle. It's all sort of this muted mid-tone range. And the final detail that you might see in there is, you know, make sure you add the eyelashes. And generally speaking, the eyelashes are going to be pointing away from the, the tear duct in the middle. They're going towards the outer edges of a person's face as a general rule. They're not always like neatly lined up, so you can have them going sort of different ways, but that's sort of the basics to this. Now, you can put whatever you would like in as sort of a reflection or a mashup of images in your eye. Um, but what we want to see is a very large detail shot of the eye filling the page. And then I want to see another image put into that iris. Whether it is a landscape, clouds, sky, like like um, like Magritte had. Or you want to put some other images in there. You want to put a basketball in there. Whatever kind of connection you want to make is up to you. But put an image in that eye.